1 Peter and maybe even into 2 Peter, I'd encourage you to, uh, to read it. Just sit down, and just take a few minutes. In, in my Bible, it's uh, just a couple of pages there, one, two, three, less than five sides of, of pages. And uh, read it through a few times, get, get familiar with it. It'll be a, a blessing to you. The, the main theme of, of 1 Peter is encouragement uh, in, in suffering. You know, these were people who, in, in those, when this was written, uh, as he says in, uh, in verse 1, they're strangers scattered throughout the different areas. These were people who, many of them had been persecuted and uh, were suffering for the, for the cause of Christ. Uh, but he, he, he relates suffering and grace and glory. Uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 7, uh, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's pretty much the theme of, of the book. You know, suffering, but it's, we're headed for glory and an encouragement that, that's there. Later on in chapter 5, verse 10, much the same. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. you know, there's hope, there's glory, uh, there's good things to come. I find it interesting that the different outlines that different ones make of it, some, are, some of them are completely different. <laughs> I won't even try to give you any of them, but uh, let's, let's read the first few verses here. We're just really going to cover the first five verses tonight. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We just stop reading there, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in, in detail. But uh, he starts off, Peter, an apostle. And uh, I, I think it's uh, important to understand what an apostle is. Uh, there's people who use the word today. L let me just tell you bluntly, there are no apostles today. Uh, if, if a person is claiming to be an apostle... One, they may be using it as a, as a work, you know, they may be using it as a label for someone who goes out and, and does certain things, uh, but an apostle was an, was an office, it's not a work. Uh, the other alternative is that quite often the, this term is used by cults, uh, where they say, oh, we have an apostle, a living apostle, and, and, and so on. Uh, they only existed in the first century. Uh, in Ephesians, he talks about how we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They were the foundation. Uh, you don't run the foundation all the way through the building, all right? It's, it's at the bottom. It's at the beginning. Uh, Acts chapter... Uh, I want to take just a, a couple of minutes on this. Acts chapter 1, when um, Judas had left the ministry, um, they decided, now whether rightly or wrongly, to choose an, another one to take his place. Some people think they were wrong. I, I don't think it was a, a problem. But anyway, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 21, uh, they said, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that, Jesus, at the, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. Uh, they, they were talking about the qualification of the one they were going to select. And they chose several and they voted and, and chose M uh, Matthias. Uh, but they said they had to be someone who had been a part of Jesus' ministry right from the beginning. And quite often they'll use the expression, you know, the 12 apostles and, and so on. There were specific people uh, in a specific time. Uh, the one exception, of course, would be Paul. Uh, and he, he calls himself, see, what was the, the way he used his 1 Corinthians 15, 58? Uh, he talks about himself as one out of due time or something like that. Let me, I got the reference here. Yeah, that's not it. 1 Corinthians 15, 8. There it is. 
And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Paul was an apostle. Uh, and so it was different. Some people think that they shouldn't have chosen Matthias because Paul should have taken his place. And that's, that's fine. Uh, but Paul, Peter was an apostle. And what that means was he had walked with Jesus. He had at the office of an apostle. Uh, in um, uh, 2 Corinthians, it, it talks about the... Uh, let me just read it here for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Uh, there were things that apostles did uh, that other people didn't do. Uh, they healed people. They raised people from the dead and so on. And uh, that's, that's a whole other another topic. But uh, Peter was an apostle. Uh, the New Testament was basically written by apostles or people who worked with an apostle. And he said, it was written by Peter Two, he says, the strangers scattered throughout, and he lists a whole a group of, of places there. Those places are basically what some people refer to as Asia Minor or modern Turkey. If you look on our map afterwards, it's basically that area of, of Turkey. Uh, below the, is it the Black Sea, I think it is? I wrote it down, yeah. And above the Mediterranean Sea there. Uh, so... He calls them strangers. Now, I don't think he means so much that they were strangers to him, but the situation they were in, they were foreigners uh, living out of their own place. Some of you have experienced that. <laughs> you know, many of us here are, are not, um, we're not born in, in Australia. I get asked quite frequently, oh, are you here on holiday? <laughs> I wish I was. No, <laughs> I never say that. Uh, if they're young, I say, I've lived here longer than you have. But, uh, you know, these were people who were out of place. Some of them probably had been scattered, like it says in, uh, in the book of Acts. I think it's Acts chapter 8, verse 4. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. Others uh, could have been people who heard the gospel preached by Peter at Pentecost. Now look at the list there sometime, in, I think it's in Acts chapter 2, where it talks about all these different people heard the gospel in their own language. And uh, many of these places uh, are listed. So some of them could have gotten saved and gone, gone back and, and been Christians in those areas. But uh, then they wouldn't have been uh, strangers other than that they were Christians in a non-Christian place. And it talks about there were people that were scattered. Uh, one of the things that we need to consider, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about this, but uh, it could come a point even in Australia, where as Christians, uh, we will be persecuted. And we need to understand how, as Christians, we need to live and how we need to respond. Uh, like we looked at this morning, uh, we're, we're not to hate people. We're not to hurt people. Um, there was one man who used to work with the gangs in, uh, I don't remember what city, but a very rough situation. And, uh, you know, witnessing to some of the gang members, they, they pulled out their knives and said, we're just going to cut you into pieces. He said, well, if you do, every piece will say, I love you. And he had a real witness to those, to those gang members. It's hard to resist someone who loves you. Uh, parents, remember that. <laughs> uh, the main thing is, is to love your kids. But anyway, uh, these, these were people that were, were strangers and foreigners who'd been, who'd been scattered. Um, it's interesting that Paul, at one point in Acts chapter 16, was, uh, and the Bible uses the word, forbidden uh, to go to some of these areas, to Asia and Bithynia. Some of you will know the, the passage there in Acts 16, um, let's see, verses 6 and 7. It said they'd gone throughout Phrygia and, and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After that, they were come to Mysia and they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Now, I don't know, you know all the ins and outs of that, why God did that, but uh, Peter then ministered to them through the, the book of, of Peter. And you know this, this term of uh, strangers, uh, of being uh, scattered people, in, in a sense applies to us as, as Christians. In uh, chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly loss. And he has some, some teaching there. As Christians, 
Uh, we have made uh, a move that says this world is not my home anymore. Yeah, we're in the world, we're not, but we're not of the world. We witness to the world, but we're not, we're not part of it anymore. And uh, you know, we're, we're, looking, uh, we're looking to go home. It's like the missionary who got home and he was on the same boat with some famous person. And boy, the band was there for that guy. You know, the crowds were there for that guy. And, and the missionary got off and there wasn't even anybody there to meet him. You know, finally he found somebody who was taking him home. And they said, well, how did, how did you feel being on the boat with that famous person? Did you, did you feel bad because they welcomed him and they didn't welcome you? He said, listen, I'm not home yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a, a good welcome when we get home. But we're not home yet. And uh, that's the kind of people Peter was, was talking to here. These were people who, I mean, Christianity wasn't just a, a walk in the park for them. You know, it wasn't just a casual thing, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. It, it was life and death. It was their life. And uh, as, we, as we look at this book, I think God will have some real encouragement for us. Uh, because really, if, if you really live the Christian life, uh, there will be some tensions. There will be some difficulties. Uh, what does he say? Uh, all that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, so this, this term of, of strangers and pilgrims, you know, we sing the song, this world is not my home. Boy, we enjoy singing that song. But, uh, you know, the truth of, of it is not, not a whole lot of fun. Uh, this world is not my home can, uh, can be pretty hard sometimes, and yet it's not. There's some real enigmas as Christians, aren't there? You know, as Christians, we go to funerals of Christians, and we, we cry, and yet we say, Praise God, you know. And uh, life is just like that sometimes. And uh, even in this introduction, he, he teaches uh, a salvation of hope and a salvation of power. And th those are the two things I wanted to, to look at tonight. In verse uh, 3, there towards the end, the middle and the end, uh, he says, In his, uh, his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a salvation of hope. God made us for glory. Now, non-Christians don't understand that. But when you get saved, you, you, you need to grab hold of that, that truth. God uses the term here, begotten. Jesus in John 3 used the term born again. And God has, has taken us from what we were, and God wants to take us from how we're born to glory. Uh, we'll see more about that. We're going to look in, in Romans later. But uh, we're, we're born, we're made for glory. God wants us to have uh, more than just, uh, what was I, I was at some, oh, I was getting a clock fixed the other day. And uh, you, know, you know how you hear conversations. Uh, he was, the workman was talking to the lady in front of me. And he must have known her, I guess. And he was saying, you know, I've been really dissatisfied with my life. Just get up in the morning, go to work, go to bed, get up. <laughs> so, of course, I'm the next customer. <laughs> and uh, so I had an opportunity to talk to him. You know, I always try and carry a track. Let, let me encourage you. Keep a gospel track in your pocket or in, in your purse or in your, your wallet. You never know when you're going to get a chance to minister to someone. And just, you know, I said a few things to him about, you know, God, God wants, like you're saying, I said, that's not what God intends your life to be. God wants you to, to live, I didn't use this term, live for glory, but uh, we have a salvation of hope. Salvation of hope. We're born for glory. We've been begotten. In verse 2, he kind of describes our birth. Uh, some of you have been at births. Uh, now physical births aren't real pretty. <laughs> uh, but a spiritual birth is a little bit different, uh, although uh, there's, there's blood and, and, and gore involved in, in our salvation. And he uses a term here in verse 2. He says, we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, I'm not a, a great scholar or anything, but I'm, just, I'm a little bit amazed at sometimes how people just try to explain away the word foreknowledge. You know, God knows. God has opened salvation to, to everyone. I, I believe that from Scripture. It's unto all and upon all them that believe. And what he's, what he's showing us here is that God wants you. You know, we live in a world where there's a lot of kids that are not wanted. Some, so much so that they kill them before they're born. What a pity. And others who, 
they're born, but you know, the parents really, they're, they're just a nuisance to their parents. Well, let me tell you, that is not true in your relationship with God. God wants you. God chose you according to the foreknowledge of God. When God, we don't even have to use the word when, God saw that you were going to trust him. And his purpose then was that you'd be like Jesus. And he, we'll, we'll see in, in Romans, he predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. We're, we're elect. We're wanted. In fact, God pleads with people to come. He didn't say, oh, no, that's enough. You know, there, there's some awful teachings, I'll be honest with you, that God says to some no and others yes. And Listen, God called everyone is to come. And God pleads with them to come. God wanted it so much he sent his only son that we could come. He gave us the way. And, and the Bible says that uh, the Holy Spirit leads us leads us to this blood of Christ through, uh, he says there in the, the next phrase, through sanctification of the Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is, is wooing people, calling them, them to come. Um, and he says, sanctified unto obedience, unto obedience. When you get saved, God's Holy Spirit begins that process of changing you uh, to be like Christ. But look with me in Romans chapter 6. Keep your finger there in, in Peter. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. It's just some verses talking about the change that God makes when we get saved. He says, Know ye not, Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. And he concludes the chapter there in verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what you've received. You know, that's the birth. Uh, we're, we're chosen, we're, we're sanctified uh, by the Holy Spirit. We're saved. And he, he talks there in, in verse 2 about the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Listen, there's no life without blood. And uh, our salvation is worked by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, he says, without shedding of blood is no remission. There's no dealing with, with sin without the blood of Christ. So we see our, our birth described. We also see our hope described. You know, as, as I mentioned, there, there's physically there's a lot of people who feel like they have no hope. Well, spiritually, that's, that should not be true. <laughs> uh, we should understand that we've been born again. Man, we're, we're begotten unto a lively hope, like he says here in, in verse 3. Um, Nowadays, we would probably use the word living. We might not say a lively hope. We'd say a living hope. Same thing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope. You know, we, say, we sing the song, I serve a risen Savior. It's true. Uh, we have a resurrected Savior. We have hope by the resurrection. And it's interesting how often truths of Scripture are attacked. And I find it very devious how Satan attacks this truth. You know, Satan attacks creation, you know, science falsely so-called. Uh, Satan attacks the flood. Satan attacks, you know, you know, lots of things. But, but to me, the way he's attacked the resurrection is he imitates it. And he makes people, he makes people believe that it's, oh, it's just a common thing. Oh, there's all kinds of people. You know, I died on the operating, I've had people say it to me. Oh, I died on the operating table, came back a lot. Uh, listen, we, we need to believe Scripture. We need to believe the Scriptures on these things. Uh, we have a living hope because Christ rose from the dead. We serve a, a living Savior. And uh, like we studied um, some of the Sunday mornings in, in December, you, you know, Jesus is in heaven interceding for us. You know, what a blessing it is uh, that we have a Savior in, in glory. In uh, oh, there's lots of verses. First John uh, two and and uh, 
verse, uh, I'm sorry, 1 John 3 and, and verse, uh, no, I'm thinking of the wrong way, chapter 2, verse 1. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It's 1 John 2, verse, verse 1. He says, don't sin, but we have an advocate. Uh, we have a living Savior. He's, he's in glory. In um, Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, he says much the same thing when he says, It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now, we have a salvation of, of hope. We have a Savior who, who wants us and cares for us and has a plan for our lives. Um, I forgot to have you look at Romans 8, verse, verse 29. I want you to see that. Very familiar verse. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Yeah, God knows, and God plans. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That starts with whom he did foreknow. When God saw that you were going to be saved, he, he made the path all the way to glory. He's got a place prepared for you. Because he wants you. And he's planning on you. And it's, it, it's going to happen. God knows. Uh, we have a living Savior, and that, that gives us hope. We also have a living word. Uh, later on in the chapter, verse uh, 23, he says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth to the Spirit, an unfeigned love of the... Of the reading verse 22, aren't I? And feign love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And verse 25, the word of the Lord endureth forever. We have the living word of God. We were saying the other day how you wouldn't want to read a science book that was in schools when I was in school. You'd laugh, you know, the things. Because it's, there's a lot of it's gone by the wayside. They say, oh, it's not true anymore. But not this book. Right. You know, this, this book endures. This is a living book. And it's the truth of God. And uh, we, can, we can stake our life on it. Uh, we have uh, a living hope. We also, in verse 4, have an inherited hope. Look at verse 4. Verse 3 talks about our lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Now, there's a couple of things about an inheritance. You don't inherit from yourself. <laughs> uh, an inheritance comes from something else, or from someone else, I should say. It's not dependent on you. Your inheritance in Christ is not dependent on you. It comes from the Lord. Secondly, an inheritance is not something new, it's something old. Uh, this is an heirloom. Yeah, this is a beauty. Uh, this is something that's eternal. And our inheritance in Christ is uh, it's not something new. It's, it's God's truth for eternity. It's not something dependent on us. It's dependent on God. We have an in inheritance. Uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, look at some of the things we inherit. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. We have the riches of the Lord. Verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Uh, we have an inheritance. Uh, it comes from God. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You know, we may not inherit much on this earth, uh, but if we do, it won't last. <laughs> It's uh, the inheritance we have, he describes there in verse 4, four things, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Uh, number one, it's incorruptible. That means it's immortal, cannot decay. Um, a few years ago, a, a friend of ours gave me his car. He'd had it since new. It wasn't new anymore. <laughs> it had decayed. <laughs> it was great having it. I remember one time a guy ran into the back of me. I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> it didn't look any worse. didn't look any better. <laughs> it, was, it was 
corrupted, you know? One time when I was in high school, we went on a science excursion, and uh, one of the um, specimens we found was a big jellyfish. Uh, I don't think my imagination, it was as big as my head kind of thing. I mean, it was a, it was a big jellyfish. I won't make any comments about how big my head is, but <laughs> anyway, we put it in a big tin, and, and it was, it was uh, Christmas holidays. So we stuck it in the, in the shed. About a month later, we pulled that thing out. Whoo, I tell you what, I learned the meaning of the word corruptible. <laughs> Man, that thing stunk. Uh, listen, our inheritance in Christ is not like that. It doesn't matter how long you, uh, you put it away. Uh, it's, it's incorruptible. It's immortal. He says as well, it's undefiled. That means it's pure. You can't mess it up. It's not like a computer program. <laughs> it's not like your computer. There's no virus that's going to get in there. Then he says it fadeth not away. That means it's permanent. I was looking at my file a week or two ago, and I pulled out a receipt. I have no idea what that receipt is for because it is completely blank. <laughs> have you ever had that happen? These, these receipts you get from the shops, you leave them long enough, they disappear. I think there's a trick they, behind that. But anyway, uh, our inheritance in Christ is not like that. You know, you're not going to pull it out someday. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> no. uh, it's, uh, it fadeth not away. It won't disappear. And, and think of it this way. It won't disappear based on what you do. It won't disappear at all. But there's nothing you can do to make it disappear. There's no trick involved. It, it, won't, it won't lose its value. I heard of a lady who inherited from her uncle, it was, it was an Italian lady, she inherited 70,000 lira. Unfortunately, um, it was declared valueless after 2011, <laughs> the lira. I mean, they were cash in hand, totally useless. Uh, our inheritance in Christ is not like that. It's permanent. It fadeth not away. It won't lose its value. And then he says, reserved in heaven for you. Uh, that word reserve means guarded. It's guarded. It's guarded by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, they're, they're taking care of it for us. So we have a salvation of hope is what we're talking about. Uh, it's not based on us. It's permanent. It's perfect. The second thing, we'll just look at it briefly tonight in verse 5. We have a salvation of power. And it's important we understand the source of the power. Who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, that word kept is a military term. It, it's protected. God has it protected. Uh, it's protected by God. And, you know, like Romans says, if God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, who's going to overpower God? It just can't happen. And the Bible says it's through faith. Kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Uh, our faith is in God. It's his power that saves us and keeps us. Now, I feel sorry for these religions where they, uh, they base their salvation, you know, I, it's not really salvation, on their works, on good works. You know, I mean, really, just logically, how many good works do you have to do to have enough? Usually what it is is however many they've done. Um, <laughs> but it's his power that saves us. I also feel sorry for people who trusted Christ but think that, there's something they've got to do to keep their salvation going. It reminds me of the guy who, he hired a chainsaw. And a couple hours later, he came back to the place he'd hired it. Man, he was exhausted. He was just, just exhausted. He said, this, is, this chainsaw, it's just too hard to use. And the guy took it over and he, boom. The guy said, what's that noise? <laughs> you know, a lot of Christians are like that. They got the Christian life, they got the power of God, and they're just struggling and struggling to do it themselves. Folks, we're not saved by our power. We're not kept by our power. What's the old song? The world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away. We're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We don't supply the power, God does. And by God's grace, we have hope. Uh, we have an inheritance, and, and as well, we, ha we just have salvation. And he uses a phrase here, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, that doesn't mean that you're only going to be saved in the last time. It means you're going to understand what your salvation really is. And you know, we study it now, and we 
we do lots of things about salvation, but you know, someday it's going to be more plain to us. Uh, the verse I started to give you, 1 John 3, 2, says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be. You know, we, we don't really see all the things that are going to be true when we're in heaven. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Um, God says to us in, in 1 Corinthians 13 uh, about our salvation, he says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. You know, we can, we can glory in the cross and we can study the scriptures and we can love the Lord, but someday we're going to see him as he is. What a blessing uh, that will be. I don't think we'll fully know salvation until we, we see Christ. Folks, we're born for glory. But the key is, are you born again? Are you born again? You know, I believe that's God's intention for every man, woman, and child on the earth, is, is for his glory to be, to be known in them. But the key is, are, are you born again? We're kept for glory. You know, God keeps us. We're kept by the power of God. Uh, next week, we're going to look at how we're prepared for glory. But you know, right now, we're strangers and pilgrims. But someday, we'll be home. We can look forward to that. Uh, you know, when you know something's temporary, uh, you can put up with it. And as Christians, we know uh, this world's not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And uh, le let me encourage you. And God encourages us through his word. Uh, have a read. Let's go to page uh, 238 in your song books. Jesus included me. Let's get Azrael come up and, and lead us in this song. We'll just sing